On the front page, one day after it was revealed that the pop duo Millie Vanilli didn't sing on their hit album, few in the music industry are surprised. I stated that I had already known that they weren't singing on those tracks well over a year ago. Maybe they wouldn't have been so disgraced if they hadn't been so successful. They lived a lie. And when the truth was out, they lived in shame. People who not only cannot go out on tour and reproduce their songs really in any way, but who also turn out not to have sung on their own records, that's really a bit of a scandal. Few in the music industry are surprised. Uh, acts, image, and visual presence is more important than their musical talent. For that blame, MTV and its growing power to sell records. When you go to see a Milli Vanilli, you go to see a great operatic, you go to see Caruso perform, you go to see something that'll last forever, now you're going to be entertained. So what is entertainment? Entertainment is scenery, costumes, lights, a facade. Milli Vanilli is a facade. Few in the music industry are surprised. Sources tell us Milli Vanilli are not the only imposters in town. They have someone else. Uh, going out lip syncing or being shown in the video as the one that's actually saying it. And I sat there and watched the television every day and saw this girl pantomime my song and she got credit for it. I saw the video for the first time and knew about the video when I saw it on TV. And how did you feel? I just stood there with my mouth hung open. I said, I don't believe this. That's really a bit of a scandal. Milli Vanilli or not the only imposters in town. Just two weeks after Millie Vanilli released their fifth single, Blame It On The Rain, and with Baby Don't Forget My Number still at number one in the USA, another European dance band with a dirty secret entered the UK charts. Black Box were an Italian dance music trio. Their debut single, Ride On Time, was entirely constructed from a huge sample taken from Lolita Holloway's 1980 disco hit, Love Sensation. But in the video and in live performances, the vocals were lip-synced by Catherine Quinol. To modern ears, the way the vocal is chopped and edited sounds unnatural and is quite obviously a sample. But in 1989, sampling was a fairly new concept, so the general public assumed the person in the video was also the singer. The group had tried in vain to find an Italian label to release the song, but with dance music not quite as lucrative in Italy as it was in other parts of Europe, they eventually found a label in the UK, Deconstruction Records. Deconstruction was distributed by RCA and eventually acquired by their parent company, none other than BMG. Neither Lolita Holloway nor the writer of Love Sensation, Dan Hartman, were consulted for permission to sample the song and they failed to mention Holloway's vocals in the credits. They did, however, clear the use of the sound recording with the rights holder to sell Soul Records, or so they thought. They had offered the label $5,000 and 1% of the royalties for the use of the sample, and they had agreed in principle. Turns out they hadn't actually signed and returned the paperwork that made the agreement official. As Holloway had unrecouped advances from the label, she wouldn't have received any of the money from this agreement, and as an American citizen, she was not eligible for the majority of neighbouring rights royalties that would have usually been paid as the USA hadn't signed the Rome Convention. It's also worth noting that the American Neighboring Rights Society Sound Exchange doesn't even recognize the sample as a performance, so it isn't eligible for any payment at all. The combination of not being credited or paid for her vocal performance that was used on Ride On Time caused great emotional distress to Lolita Holloway. This was number one for six weeks, and I sat there and watched the television every day and saw this girl pantomime my song and she got credit for it. With no legal recourse available, Holloway's counsel engaged in a press attack on Black Box and eventually secured a settlement that paid the singer an undisclosed sum. As the writer of the original track, Hartman was able to sue the group and the court ruled in his favour. He was awarded an undisclosed fee and listed as a writer on the new recording. The writing credit would entitle him to a share of the publishing revenue from the Black Box track. The legal action led Black Box to re-record the track with uncredited vocals by an up-and-coming singer. In 1990, when M People released their debut single on Deconstruction Records, it became obvious the uncredited vocals were by the group's lead singer, Heather Small. The members of Black Box were quite surprised by the whole situation. Back in Italy, it was quite normal to use models or dancers to lip-sync in videos and for TV performances. They claimed they didn't even know Lolita Holloway was still alive. They were quoted as saying that she rose from the dead to attack them in the press and eventually sue them. 
a complete mystery why they would think a singer, who was barely 45 years old at the time they had sampled her, had died already. Ride On Time was number one in three countries and became the UK's biggest selling single of 1989. It sold over 850,000 copies in the UK alone and over 1.5 million worldwide. Lolita Holloway did eventually receive a settlement from Black Box and their label, although it seems she was not entirely satisfied with the outcome. Okay, they settled now. They call themselves settling, you know. But uh, like they said with Lolita, they made it very clear that I'm, you know, not supposed to talk about it bad. So I'm not talking about it bad. I'm very, very happy. The success of Ride On Time led Black Box to start work on an album. They drafted in Martha Wash from The Weather Girls to record some demos for them. During the session, she recorded vocals for a number of different tracks, some original songs and a cover of Earth, Wind & Fire's Fantasy. All of Black Box's six other singles, Everybody, Everybody, Open Your Eyes, Hold On, I Don't Know Anybody Else, Strike It Up and Fantasy, all contain vocals from those sessions with Martha Wash. None of them credit her as the vocalist, and just like Ride On Time, Katrin Quinol mimes the vocals in the video and appears on the cover of the single. Quinol also toured with the group, so would mime the vocals for all the tracks at the gigs. There were a few occasions when she attempted to sing on top of Martha Wash's pre-recorded vocals. <laughs> No. In September 1990, Martha Wash sued Black Box and RCA Records for commercial appropriation. RCA settled the case out of court in December 1990 and agreed to pay her a substantial fee. RCA also signed her to an eight-album recording contract and financed her national tour. As a result of the lawsuit, there was new federal legislation introduced in the USA making vocal credit mandatory for all albums and music videos. Catherine Quinnell left the group in 1991 following the court cases, but Black Box went on to record another album and are still active today. The second album, without Martha Wash's vocals, didn't sell anywhere near what the first album sold, but the remaining members of the group were not hounded out of the music industry or ridiculed like Millie Vanilli. Catherine's account of her time with Black Box mirrors much of the Millie Vanilli story too. She was a model by day and a go-go dancer by night. She would often sing at the end of the night. She enjoyed singing, and although she didn't want to quit her modelling career, she jumped at the chance to be part of Black Box. They asked her to be their lead singer, even though by that time Ride On Time was already recorded and the sessions with Martha Wash were underway. Quinnell assumed that much like European dance music of the time, it would be limited to the clubs and any success would be brief. After she agreed to join, she was told the vocals had been recorded and she was only needed for pictures and videos, so she treated it just like a modelling job. After Ride On Time became a hit across Europe, she felt trapped into continuing her promotional duties. After leaving Black Box, she did try to start a music career on her own. In 1995, she released the single Feel You under the name Back In A Box featuring Katrin, with no success. The ink had barely dried on the settlement with Black Box when Martha Wash found herself in a similar situation again. I didn't know that the whole thing was going on until I saw the video on TV. In June 1990, she'd been paid around $1,000 to record a demo for David Cole and Robert Clavillez. The demo she recorded was never completed, but they used some parts of her vocals to create the chorus of a new song. They had originally intended the song to be for an R&B trio they were working with called Trilogy, but the group turned down the chance to record the song. Nevertheless, they decided to play the unfinished song to A&M Records, who were so impressed they offered them a recording deal just on the strength of the incomplete demo. Using the first initials of each of their last names, they decided to call this new project CNC Music Factory. They brought in unknown rapper Freedom Williams to finish the song around Martha Wash's demo vocals. The song, Gonna Make You Sweat, Everybody Dance Now, was released as CNC Music Factory featuring Freedom Williams. They did credit Martha Wash for her vocal, but just as a backing vocalist, and in the video for the single, Zelma Davis mimes to her performance. Just like Katrin Quinnall in Black Box, Selma Davis was presented as the group's lead singer. She's the only female pictured on the artwork and lip syncs in all the videos. She did actually record some vocals for other CNC Music Factory releases, just not this one. Martha Wash contacted CNC Music Factory in the hope of negotiating proper credits and some royalties. 
The requests were denied as ultimately they believed that the $1,000 and background credit were more than sufficient for her contribution to the recording. Not willing to let it drop, Martha Wash decided to take legal action. Martha Wash is suing Clavillis, Cole and CBS Sony Music for a half million dollars. Even if you got a performer's permission to put one person's voice in another person's body, you do not have the permission of the American public to not be lied to. It's a hurtful thing. And um, it's something that I'm dealing with now. On December the 11th, 1990, Martha Wash sued A&M's parent company, Sony Music, for fraud, deceptive packaging and commercial appropriation. Sony was not willing to settle out of court. They believed they had done nothing wrong. They had credited her as a background singer and they argued that on a rap song, the featured performer is the rapper and the singer of the chorus is rarely credited as a featured performer. This is partly true. If the singer is a session singer or an unknown singer and they're singing the chorus on a song that features a rapper, it is unlikely that they will be credited as featured. But when the chorus vocalist is well known, they are nearly always credited as a featured performer. I would consider Martha Wash to be well known just for its reigning men, not to mention her work with Sylvester and the Black Box songs. She's more than deserving of a featured credit. Sony disagreed and fought the case for three years before eventually reaching a settlement. They may actually have won had it not been for the precedent set by the earlier Black Box case. Sony paid a fee to Martha Wash, credited her as lead vocalist, listed her as featured on all future pressings and asked MTV to add a disclaimer that credited Wash for vocals and Zelma Davis for visualization to the gonna make you sing that part, that, so they'll know. <laughs> if you can hit that note. <laughs> Okay, so not that then. Perhaps Freedom Williams has an idea of why she wasn't touring with them. I think Martha being in the business so long, 15 years, 10, 15 years, especially, didn't want to go into a dance January like this. Excuse me, I'm sorry, a what now? I mean, they didn't want to a dance January like this. I think he means genre. But actually, since making the switch from gospel to disco in 1975, Martha Wash has made nothing but music within the genre of dance. But carry on. So she chose really not to go on the road with us, which is the reason why we hired Delma in the first place, because we didn't have a, a singer to travel on the road. OK, so let's hear what Martha Wash has to say about being asked to tour with CNC Music Factory and turning it down. I was not asked to be a member of the group. I was not asked to travel with them, anything like that. So it was like, well, wow, you know, you, you, you made a hit song off of this woman's voice. How come we can't see her? What's the big deal? Because she's a heavy set woman with a beautiful face and this gigantic, fabulous, tremendous, rock kicking ass voice. Somehow or another, the people who do market, marketing research feel that if you're thin, a size four, size six, if you will, you sell better, regardless of how you sound. I tell you this, and I don't mean to be rude, harsh, callous, and malign, or vilifying, but I'd rather look at them on stage. Despite only being a featured performer and not one of the founding members of the group, in the late 1990s, Freedom Williams appropriated the band's name and began touring a serious insult in the world. The two have been feuding on social media ever since, with Clavillas posting a lengthy open letter to Freedom Williams. Having been certified five times platinum in the USA and selling more than seven million copies worldwide, Gonna Make You Sweat remains CNC Music Factory's biggest hit. Surprisingly, this isn't the first time David Cole and Robert Cavillas had used Martha Wash's vocals on a track without crediting her properly. Before she recorded the vocals for what would become Gonna Make You Sweat, she recorded a demo of a song written by Cole and Cavillas called You're My One and Only. The demo was finished off by adding backing vocals and released under the name Seduction, although at this point the name was just a pseudonym for Cole and Clavillis. The artwork for the original release doesn't feature any photographs and instead just credits the producers and the guest rap. The single was an unexpected hit and peaked at number 23 on the Billboard charts. They put together a group to promote the single and recorded a video with them lip-syncing to Martha Wash's vocals. The group released an album, Nothing Matters Without Love. This included new tracks they'd recorded, and You're My One and Only, with Martha Wash's vocals still at the front. The album cover credits the three group members with singing all the lead vocals. And the only credit for Martha Wash is buried at the bottom, 
and just for background vocals. When David Cole found out Martha Wash was upset, he offered her 1% of the royalties as a settlement. Martha Wash's lawyer believed a featured performer should get something more like 10%, so just as he was preparing to sue Sony, he also started legal proceedings against A&M Records. A&M Records settled the case in December of 1990. But David Cole was still rather dismissive of Martha Wash's contribution to the track's success, stating in the New York Times in 1990 that anybody could have sung the song. Despite the disagreement, Martha Wash continued to record with CNC Music Factory. In 1994, she featured on one of their tracks, Do You Want to Get Funky? This time, however, she was credited in full for her contribution and even appeared in the music video alongside Zelma Davis. In 1989, Belgian dance producer Joe Bohard, under the name The Pro-24s, released an instrumental dance track called Technotronic. He enlisted a rapper from the local hip-hop scene in Antwerp, Yarkid K, to add words to the track. He decided to call the project Technotronic and renamed the song after the first few words of the new lyrics. Pump Up The Jam was a hit in the clubs and on the radio across much of Europe. So now there would need to be a proper release. They would need to make a video and create proper artwork. Instead of using Yarkid K on the cover of the single, Bohart instead chose model Feli Kalingi and credited her with the vocal by releasing the track as Technotronic featuring Feli. He also had Feli lip sync the vocals in the video and in TV performances. The result is less than convincing. Pump up the jam, pump it up, why your feet are stumping. Pump Up The Jam was released and entered the UK charts on August 27th, 1989, just as Black Box reached number two on the way to the top spot with Ride On Time. Following the commercial success of Pump Up The Jam, a Technotronic album was released on the 28th of November, 1989. It included five tracks written by and featuring Yarkid K, yet the album cover still had a picture of Feli. When it was discovered that Feli was not the real vocalist on the tracks, Bohart and the record label quickly changed tactics mid-release. The album artwork was changed to a picture of Yarkid K, and all the singles now credited the actual performer. She also appeared in the videos and took over promotional duties. This was all done prior to any promotional work in the USA, so they avoided any wide-scale scrutiny. It does seem like the change was made at the last minute, though, and in a hurry. Performing Pump Up The Jam, give it up for Technotronic. Here you can see Arsenio Hall is holding up a copy of the Technotronic album with Feli on the cover, and then introduces a performance with Yarkid K. Oh, the jam, pump it up. Pump Up the Jam went on to sell over 1.8 million copies worldwide. So that's four other groups other than Milli Vanilli in 1989 and 1990 that mimed to the performances of uncredited or miscredited singers. Let's look at how all the events fit together. In March 1989, Milli Vanilli released Girl You Know It's True in the USA, followed by Baby Don't Forget My Number in April. While that was on its way up the Billboard charts, Black Box released Ride On Time in July. Also in July 89, You're My One and Only is released under the name Seduction, with uncredited vocals from Martha Wash. July was a busy month. It also saw the release of Midi Vanilli's Blame It on the Rain, and was the month of the gig where the playback device jammed and skipped. In August, Technotronic released Pump Up the Jam and credit Yaki K's vocals to Feli, while Milli Vanilli released Girl I'm Gonna Miss You. Lolita Holloway reached a settlement over Ride on Time in September of 1989. In March of 1990, Black Box released Everybody Everybody, with Catherine Quinol now miming to vocals by Martha Wash. Six months later, Martha Wash sues Black Box. On the 12th of November 1990, Frank Farin admits Rob and Fab are not the singers on any Milli Vanilli songs. On the 20th of November, Rob and Fab hold a press conference and offer to give back the Grammy. While all eyes are on Milli Vanilli, CNC Music Factory release Gonna Make You Sweat, and 1990 ends with Martha Wash suing Sony over CNC Music Factory, and settling with A&M over seduction. Maybe they wouldn't have been so disgraced if they hadn't been so successful. So we know Millie Vanilli weren't the only ones. Were they at least the most successful? Here are the top 10 selling songs of 1989 and 1990 that were not sung by the credited singer. At number 10, a surprise hit for Clavillis and Coles under the name Seduction with You're My One and Only True Love. At number 9, it's Black Box with the uncredited vocals of Martha Wash singing Fantasy. At number 8, it's another one from Black Box, again with vocals from Martha Wash, 
I don't know anybody else. At number seven, it was number one in six countries, Girl, I'm Gonna Miss You by Millie Vanilli. At number six, another one from Millie Vanilli, Baby, Don't Forget My Number. At number five, with 1.2 million sales worldwide, it's another one from Millie Vanilli, Blame It On The Rain. At number four, with 1.6 million copies worldwide, it's Black Box, Right On Time. This time, vocals from Lolita Holloway. At number three, with 1.3 million copies sold, it's Milli Vanilli, Girl, You Know It's True. Just ahead of them at number two, with 1.8 million copies worldwide, it's Pump Up The Jam, Technotronic. But at number one, with 5.5 million copies worldwide, that's more than every single Milli Vanilli single combined, it's CNC Music Factory with Gonna Make You Sweat. Milli Vanilli weren't the only ones at that time. They weren't the biggest selling, and they weren't the first. We know Frank Farian employed Bobby Farrell to mime his vocals for Boney M throughout their heyday in the 70s, but that wasn't an isolated incident. You only have to go back a few years to find another example. In 1981, record producer Ken Gold put together a group of session singers and recorded two medleys of 1960s pop songs called Back to the 60s and Back to the 60s Part 2. We're going to get back to the 60s now with... I'll tell you something else, there's a very famous disc jockey face here. You watch as we go back. He released them under the group name Tight Fit. The first of the singles went to number four on the UK charts. But instead of the session singers who sang on the record, a group of actors was hired to front the group when they first appeared on BBC TV's Top of the Pops. In 1982, a different producer recorded a cover version of The Lion Sleeps Tonight. The song featured Roy Ward, the former drummer and percussionist from the British 70s band City Boy on lead vocals. The song was also released under the name Tight Fit. But this time a different lineup, fronted by model Steve Grant, appeared on Top of the Pops. This single went to number one. The new lineup were able to sing and actually recorded songs for an album, but their vocal abilities were nothing compared to Roy Ward. Their follow up single that they did sing on, Fantasy Island, made it to number five, but nothing else even came close to matching the success of The Lion Sleeps Tonight. Steve Grant still tours nearly 40 years later on the back of a song he just mimed to on TV. He does now attempt to sing it live, although it seems after more than 30 years of practice, emulating Roy Ward's performances still beyond him. In the jungle, the mighty jungle, the lion sleeps tonight. It's no coincidence that the first tight fit single entered the top 10 the same month that MTV was first launched. MTV ushered in a new era of pop culture, where pop stars and movie stars were fused into one. No longer could you just sound good, you had to look good too. MTV aren't entirely responsible for the change, but they definitely capitalised on the trend, and in doing so, amplified it. MTV evolved from a format first developed for a Nickelodeon show called Pop Clips. The show's creator was Michael Nesmith, who was himself a member of a popular group that mimed on TV to songs they didn't record. The Monkees were a Beatles-style pop band created for a TV show that went on to sell over 70 million records. Each of the members had musical skills. They played instruments and could sing, but despite being presented as a band that played their own instruments, they only recorded limited vocals on the early recordings. Even more bizarrely, they mimed playing different instruments to the ones they actually knew how to play best. Mickey Dolan's a guitarist, pretended to play drums. Michael Nesmith, a bass player, was on guitar. Peter Tork, a more experienced guitar player than Nesmith, was on bass, and Davy Jones was lead vocalist, despite Mickey Dolan's being widely regarded as a far better singer. Davy Jones had volunteered to pretend to play the drums, but it was decided as he wasn't the tallest member of the group, sitting behind the drums wouldn't be a good look. So it's clear here that much like Millie Vanilli, the look was far more important to the producers than actual musical ability. The biggest difference between the Monkees and Mini Vanilli is that the members of the Monkees were given the opportunity to develop as musicians and recording artists. For the first few months, they were only allowed limited input into the recordings, although Michael Nesmith contributed songs he had written from the outset. Nesmith had already released four singles prior to auditioning, and after he was cast in the Monkees, the production company behind the show bought out the rights to his songs so they could use them in the show. Over the years, each of the members learned how to play the instruments they were pretending to play and all became accomplished multi-instrumentalists. 
They played instruments and sung on their later recordings, and by 1967 they had sacked their producer and musical director Don Kirshner and were now functioning more independently. However, ratings for the show had declined along with record sales and the show was cancelled in 1969. The band continued to release music with their founding lineup until 1971 and have had revivals and reunions in each of the following decades. The two surviving members of the group, Michael Nesmith and Mickey Dolan, still tour as the Monkees. After being dismissed as the producer and musical director for the Monkees, Don Kirshner went on to create another band for a TV show. The Archies were a fictional band from the Saturday morning animated comedy show, The Archie Show, based on the Archie comics. They released five studio albums and a greatest hits compilation in the 60s and 70s and had four top 40 singles in the USA. The recordings were made by session musicians who were only paid a session fee and the record sleeves didn't credit any of them. The voice actors from the TV show didn't contribute to the recorded music released under the names of their characters. This was pop music recorded by anonymous session musicians, released under an assumed name and presented to the public with an image considered more commercially viable. Does that sound familiar? It wasn't until the mid-70s that it was revealed that all five voices of the Archies was provided by one person, Ron Dante. Ron Dante was a staff writer at Don Kirshner's publishing company, Alden Music. Another one of the staff writers at Alden Music was also guilty of presenting a recording by one singer as another singer's work. Phil Spector is one of the best known producers in the history of the music industry. One of the first groups he produced was The Crystals. The Crystals were a girl band from New York that Spector signed when they were just teenagers, around 16 years old. As they were so young and still in school, their parents wouldn't permit them to fly from New York to LA to record with him. So instead, with the help of his high school friend and saxophonist Steve Douglas, he assembled a group of musicians to provide the backing tracks and brought in seasoned session singer Darlene Love for the vocals. Following the success of the recordings they had done with Phil Spector, the musicians he had assembled became the most sought after session players in Los Angeles. They became known as the Wrecking Crew and were often hired as ghost players. It was in fact this group of musicians that played uncredited on the first two albums by the Monkees. So Darlene Love along with the Wrecking Crew recorded He's a Rebel for Phil Spector and he released it as the crystals. When we went into the recording studio, we knew we were recording this record for the crystals. We knew that. We went in. So my deal with Phil Spector was, if I'm going to sing lead on this record, you're going to have to pay me. But I didn't know the record was going to be a hit. <laughs> <laughs> and not only was it a hit, it was a number one. Darlene Love also recorded lead vocals for the follow-up single, He Sure the Boy I Love. Spectre would again release it under the name The Crystals, but this time Darlene Love was kept in the dark as well. Man, the next one was out, was called He Shoot a Boy I Love, <laughs> which was a crystal record, but it was supposed to be the first Darlene Love record. And I'm tootling along in my car, and, and the disc jockey says, and here's the next record just released by The Crystals, and He Shoot a Boy I Love come on the radio. Now nah, I was really pissed. The Crystals were upset that Phil Spector had substituted them with Darlene Love and her group The Blossoms twice. He obviously ignored their protests as he would later use four recordings by the Ronettes for the album The Crystal Sings the Greatest Hits. As both He's a Rebel and He's Sure the Boy I Love feature on that 12 track album, it means only half the tracks were actually The Crystals singing, which makes the title more than a little bit deceptive. So even in 1962, nearly 30 years before Milli Vanilli, we're still seeing similar examples. And yet these still are not the first either. For that, we have to go back even further. While millions of movie fans have heard my voice in films, few have ever seen my face. I am what is known in Hollywood as a dubber or a ghost. I do the actual singing while the star mouths the words before the cameras. I have ghosted for Margaret O'Brien, I have been the singing voice of the star in several major movie musicals. I sang for Deborah Carr in The King and I, and for Natalie Wood in West Side Story. Time magazine recently referred to me as the ghostess with the mostest. What 
is your name, please? My name is Marnie Nixon. Marnie Nixon was one of the most prolific dubbers in Hollywood in the 50s and 60s. She began her movie career at MGM, first as a messenger, but it wasn't long before she caught the eye of the studio's talent scouts. And they were actually going to groom me for, to be a starlet. They were particularly impressed with their singing abilities, so instead of appearing in front of the camera, she made her movie debut off-screen as the angelic voices heard by Joan of Arc in the 1948 movie starring Ingrid Bergman. In her next movie, she provided the singing voice for 11-year-old child star Margaret O'Brien. She was 18 at the time. The scene required her to sing a Hindi lullaby, so Nixon pre-recorded the song and O'Brien mouthed the words on camera. She was never credited for the singing. She was what the movie industry called a ghost. A ghost, certainly in movie terms, would be somebody who does work like Marnie Nixon has always done that is kind of uh, uncredited. But that wasn't ever particularly talked about because they didn't, Hollywood didn't want to destroy the illusion. It wasn't long before Marnie was dubbing for the biggest stars in Hollywood. In 1953, she dubbed parts for Marilyn Monroe's vocal in Diamonds Are a Girl's Best Friend. She had an amazing ability to mimic the voice of the person she was dubbing for, so her work was barely noticeable. I took great pride in having nobody notice that there was any difference in, uh, in the accent, in the speech pattern, and the sound, the timbre of their voice. I tried to color my voice so that it became them. In 1956, she landed her biggest role up to that time. She would be singing all of the songs for Deborah Carr in The King and I. The studio made it clear that secrecy was essential. The 20th Century Fox at that time, with The King and I, called me and they said that if anyone ever knew that I did any part, any part of the dubbing, that they would see to it that I wouldn't work in town again. Can you imagine? I was scared to death. Word did get out that the vocals had been dubbed, but it was Deborah Carr herself who didn't keep the secret. Although she downplayed just how much Marty Nixon's vocals had been used. The headline of the article was, Deborah tells a secret, and she said my name. She said I only did the high notes, which was not really true. The King and I won five of the nine Oscars it was nominated for, including Best Music and Best Sound. It also won two Golden Globes, Best Musical and Best Actress for Deborah Carr. The soundtrack went to number one on the UK album charts. The soundtrack doesn't credit Marnie Nixon with the performance, it credits Deborah Carr instead. For The King and I, it was decided early on that all the singing would be dubbed. But when Marnie Nixon dubbed for Natalie Wood in West Side Story and Audrey Hepburn in My Fair Lady, in both cases the actors had recorded all the songs in their own voice, only for the film studio to decide it wasn't good enough and replace their singing with Marnie Nixon. You can decide if they made the right choice. Only you, you're the only thing I'll see forever. In my eyes, in my words, and in everything I do, nothing else but you. In my eyes, in my words, and in everything I do, nothing else but you. Lots of chocolate for me to eat. Lots of chocolate for me to eat. Lots of cow Mike and lots of eat. Lots of cow Mike and lots of eat. How would it be lovely? How would it be lovely? From the early days of movie musicals through the TV shows of the 60s and 70s to the MTV generation of the 1980s and onwards, there's been countless examples of singers not being credited for their work and someone else being recognised instead. Tens of millions of records have been sold, billions of dollars have been made and awards have been given out. For some reason, Millie Vanilli have come to symbolise something that existed before them and continues long after. Artists like Jennifer Lopez, TLC, Selena Gomez and Britney Spears have all released records that employed ghost singers. When you look at all the past examples and the now ubiquitous use of auto-tune, Melodyne and other pitch correction technology, 
it's hard not to think that Rob Pilatus and Fab Morven were dealt with a little bit harshly. Now, what do you think? Let me know in the comments and be sure to subscribe and turn on notifications to get all the latest videos. Thank you.